Hey everyone, happy July, happy summer. Welcome to Das Criminal Podcast. I'm Erin. And I'm Amar. And we have the start of a very special little mini series for you today. Yes,、uh, appropriately starting in July, named after today's topic, Julius Caesar, from which the month derives its name. And we do want to give a shout out to friend of the pod and patron subscriber Meher because she prompted us to do a series on ancient assassinations and crimes and imperialism. So that is what we are bringing to you. Yeah, thanks, Meher. Hope you enjoy this episode. So Julius Caesar, he is one of the most complex characters in all of political history, and this is actually one of the reasons I. Really like learning about Caesar. Like I find him interesting because so many classical figures make their way into the books as unambiguous heroes or villains, and Caesar's legacy is quite complicated. Was he a rising tyrant intent on destroying the Roman Republic, or was he a man of the people whose growing popularity threatened the power of Rome's elite governing class, or perhaps both of these? He also has a salad named after him too. So. There's that. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that's a level of popularity everyone aspires to get. You know, like you have a Caesar salad, you don't have like an Amer salad or something. Also, Caesar's name lent itself to the title of Caesar and all derivatives thereof, including Kaiser in Germany and Tsar in Russia. I'm sorry, I have to ask, what would an Amer salad have on it? Cheese, feta cheese, definitely.、Uh, lettuce. Uh, tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, though not like the fucking like big tomatoes.、Uh, balsamic. And... You're literally describing a Greek salad. Yeah, I know, but I like Greek salads. It's really <laughs> fucking good. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, okay. In my in my defense, I'm sure the Caesar salad existed before Caesar. He just put his name on it, much like I can put my name on a Greek salad. Yeah. Next time I go to this place near my house called Pita Gourmet, I'm gonna ask for an Amer salad and see how they Can respond. Can you please do? Please, 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 please. <laughs> It pretends to be a Greek restaurant, but I know for a fact it's owned by Lebanese people. <laughs> I mean, that's that's multiculturalism for you. So moving back to Julius Caesar, his legacy and the history of ancient Rome has beckoned hundreds, if not thousands. Of literary and cinematic interpretations, from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar to the 2000 film Gladiator, starring Russell Crowe, the pomp and splendor of ancient Rome has always been a setting of intrigue. It's easy to forget that Julius Caesar was a real person with a massive impact on the history of our world, and not only a classical archetype synonymous with military and political ambition. So, in this episode, we're going to try and explore the life and times of Julius Caesar. Who was this fascinating man? What is in his salad? How was he instrumental in Rome's transition from republic to empire? Why was he assassinated? And why is that assassination still controversial almost two thousand years later? So we use a couple different sources for this episode. I watched Netflix's Roman Empire, which we understand is sometimes dramatized and not always totally accurate. But it is nonetheless interesting and entertaining, and we're not going to uncritically regale you with a Netflix series, so don't worry. We're also using Michael Parenti's "The Assassination of Julius Caesar" and Mary Beard's "SPQR"、um, as sources, as well as HBO's TV show "Rome," which, if you're not a nerd or a dweeb and don't want to read books, you can watch the TV show because it has a lot of drunkards and a lot of tits. That's. Pretty typical of HBO, I would say. Yeah, I mean they're bringing history to the masses, the horny masses, if you will. Let's start with a little overview of our main man, Gaius Julius Caesar. He was born into a wealthy and powerful patrician family that lost its fortune when Caesar's father took the wrong side in a civil war. So when we say patrician, we're talking about one of the two classes of ancient Rome. So Roman citizens were largely divided into the patricians and the plebeians, and the patricians were broadly the wealthy landowning class, and the plebs were everyone else. And Rome also had a large population of enslaved people who were shunned entirely, so they weren't patricians or plebs. 
Yeah, and by the late Republic, just before Caesar was born, uh, the descendants of the patricians had controlled the Senate, along with what they called a rising homo nuevos, or new man, the sort of uh, a rising class of land-owning aristocrats who emerged from a sort of burgeoning middle class. They weren't necessarily patricians by blood, they weren't old money, quote-unquote, but they managed to squeeze their way into the elite through wealth and then political connections, usually by um, becoming one of the executive offices in the Republic. So praetor, consul, among other things. These Roman uh, new men, if you will, they, they couldn't trace them their lineages back that far into patrician families, but they also, their interests aligned with the patrician. So they were like new patricians, so to speak. Yeah, to give you a modern day example, and this is actually the best one I can think of, is Meghan Markle. Like, she's not royal, but she is a wealthy actress and married into nobility. Exactly, exactly. That's about it, yeah. Um, and yeah, a lot of a lot of those uh, new patricians managed to even get into the old families through marriage. Yeah, the Meghan Markles of ancient Rome. Pretty much. And the elites had all but monopolized agricultural land around Rome by this time. So initially, there was a lot of public land around Rome that was farmed by small shareholder families, and they would pay a nominal amount of rent to the state and then farm for their own subsistence. But uh, throughout the sort of uh, years, uh, these elites end up buying those large tracts of land from the state and forcing rural plebeians into the cities because the elites would rather have slaves work the farms than pay, you know, rural farm holders. Uh, and so these rural plebs, um, they don't, they no longer have land. They move to the city and they live in these really, really sort of bank slums concentrated in a circle around Rome's downtown. And, you know, they, they have no running water. They have no safe, like, you know, building codes. Buildings often would burn. They'd crumble. Uh, entire families would live in a room. And those are, those are the plebeians, the sort of non, the, the, the urban proletariat, if you will. And, Below that, you have what Erin just said, which are the slaves, and they don't even count as plebes. They're the property. And it's estimated that um, a third of Italy at the time comprised of slaves, uh, but the population was always naturally on the wane because of the horrific conditions in mines and plantations, and they were always dying, and so the, the population needed replenishing, which Rome did through imperial conquests. Yeah, some dark stuff. So Julius Caesar decides to join the Roman army in an attempt to restore his family's wealth and honor. And at this point, the ultimate goal for a Roman man, like the pinnacle of masculinity, is glory. And that can be achieved through these conquests because Rome is presently an expanding empire. So as a soldier, Julius Caesar was quite exceptional. He was skilled. He was smart. He was very good at conquering things. And at this point in his life, he also had a wife named Cornelia, but she passed away when Caesar was in his early 30s. And Caesar also had a daughter named Julia. What's interesting about Rome at this time is that women were not allowed their own nomen or cognomens, which is to say they weren't allowed their own names. So if you have a daughter in Rome, the daughter's name is the name of her family, your family. So if you're a paterfamilias, you're you're the head of your family, and your name is Gaius Julius Caesar, your middle name, Julius, that's the name of your familias, uh, your nomen, and all your daughters will be called Julia, literally all of them. There's no other name, just Julia. And the way you distinguish them is Julia the elder, Julia the younger, Julia the second, the third, the fourth, um, if you have multiple daughters. This makes researching the ancient times so difficult, too. Oh, yeah. It's, it, the, the names of people are just all over the place. They have the same name. It's like, have you seen the Disney movie Hercules where one of those little goblins, Pain or Panic, goes like, do you remember when all the boys were called Jason and all the girls were called Brittany? Like, <laughs> this is that. <laughs> So after Cornelia dies, Caesar briefly remarries a woman named Pompeia, but that marriage doesn't go so well. And the way it dissipates 
I think is kind of funny. So at that time, which was around 62 BC, Caesar was serving as Pontifex Maximus, which was Rome's chief priest. And it was therefore the duty of his wife, Pompeia, to hold the rites of the Bonadea, a woman-only religious ceremony shrouded in mystery. It seems like this weird sorority event where they would like, I don't know, drink blood or something. Who knows? They all have sex together. Probably. Or pillow fights. We're not sure. But a man named Publius Claudius disguised himself as a woman to crash the party and try to flirt with Pompeia, which seems like a weird plan because, like, why would he dress up as a woman and then, like, sneak up on her and be like, hey, I'm actually, like, (laughs) what a, (laughs) I don't get it. But I digress. So Publius Claudius was charged for such debauchery And the trial was really sensational. This was like Rome's O.J. Simpson trial. Everyone was reading the news about it. Everyone wanted to see what happened to him. And like our friend O.J., he was acquitted. But the scandal was really embarrassing for Caesar. So he divorced Pompeia. And he apparently stated that his wife must be above suspicion. And in all the sources about this, it says that's where the phrase the king's wife or Caesar's wife must be above suspicion comes from. And I had never heard that phrase in my life. Yeah, I don't. This is the first time I'm hearing of it, to be honest with you. But maybe it's one of those things like, you know, when you learn a new word and then suddenly you hear it all the time. Yeah, yeah, probably. So now you're going to hear Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. And you're going to be like... Also, the guy had affairs like left, right and center. So it's a bit hypocritical. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird what makes a Roman scandal. Yeah. Oh, and ironically, by the way, uh, Publius Claudius was a one-time ally of Caesar when they were both in the Senate. Before before Caesar became a soldier, he was consul for a year during the first triumvirate. And he was sort of associated with Claudius because they were both uh, part of the populari, which are the, non, the non-patricians, so to speak. The non-patrician aligned uh, faction in the Senate. Yeah. As we said, Rome at this point is an expanding empire. It is constantly conquering lands all around the Mediterranean. And the empire developed a demand for slaves to build roads and aqueducts, as Amr previously mentioned. Rome's wealth largely depended on slave labor to keep moving in the direction that it was. So politicians in Rome require not just money, but military success to really be respected in the eyes of the people. And Caesar, he's a bright military strategist, and he's a really skilled soldier. So he's primed as a member of the patrician class to step into politics. Meanwhile, some of the slaves, rightfully so, are not happy with their position in Rome. And one of them, a former gladiator and military leader from Thrace, which is modern day like Turkey, Bulgaria, Greece, that area, Eastern Europe, was taken captive by Rome. His name is Spartacus. May have heard of him. Just like the TV show. Yeah. He escaped and he led a slave rebellion up the coast of Italy. And the Roman Senate sent multiple warriors to quell the revolt, but all of these failed until the Battle of Solaris River in 71 BC. So the Roman army, under this guy named Marcus Crassus, who, at least in the Netflix series, is portrayed as like a total dweeb, he actually manages to defeat Spartacus. And after the battle, Spartacus is presumed dead, but his body is never found. And Marcus Crassus, who we'll hear on just refer to as Crassus, captured 6,000 of the slave rebels and crucified them on the road to Rome. So if you're walking from Solaris to Rome, every 100 feet or so, or maybe 100 meters, there would be a rebel crucified in a message to all these other enslaved people, don't try that because we will defeat you and then torture you, basically. Yeah, I mean, crucifixion is like one of the worst ways to die. Because, you know, you get nailed into a cross and the most common way of dying is you basically get so tired, you can't breathe anymore because when you breathe, you have to raise your diaphragm up. And if you're like, you know, hanging from something, if you're not like your feet are not on the floor, you need energy to raise yourself up every time. And eventually your energy just saps and you don't longer carry yourself and you sort of suffocate. Yeah, these ancient people are 
extremely creative in their punishments. Yeah, I mean, between that and our previous episode with the scapism, I wouldn't want to go back in time if I had a time machine, let's just say that. Yeah, for sure. At this point, 71 BC, 70 BC, Rome is still technically a republic governed by an elected senate, but like we said, is expanding as an empire and also enslaves people. So there is, of course, a debate to be had about what a republic actually means. So there's a position, which is the executive head of the Senate, called the consul position. It's the most powerful in Rome. There's actually two consuls in a given term, and each consul has veto power over the other, which is supposed to be their version of checks and balances. And consuls are elected by assembly votes, uh, not the Senate directly, but by tribal assemblies of people. And each consul is elected to serve one year term. Yeah, it sounds to me actually pretty inefficient, but that's one of the reasons actually that the Roman Republic maybe wasn't as successful as it could have been was because it actually had a lot of inefficiencies built in. Yeah, I mean, it was very convoluted and we're going to get into this later, but their constitution was not written. It relied on this sort of unwritten set of rules that were often bended or broken depending on who was in charge and what they wanted. Uh, There were also, like, different assemblies that had different powers that contradicted each other. Like, the tribal assemblies could pass legislation and bypass the Senate at various times, but then their power was curbed. There's also the people's tribunes, which are supposed to represent the plebs against the patricians, but those can easily be bought off by the patricians. And there's also various magistrates, like praetors and uh, judges and so on and so forth. It also just begs this much larger political question about how do we concentrate power? And we know historically that republics and democracies operate quite slowly, and that's typically meant to be a way to curb power. Like It takes a long time to get significant change done, so you really have to think about it, deliberate, etc. But in a circumstance when things go wrong and things are dangerous, like Frankly, I would like someone with power to say, everyone has to wear a mask. It's not a political question related to COVID, you know? Yeah, or just like simply like, okay, everyone gets healthcare now. Like everyone gets a vaccine, yeah. So Crassus, the guy we just mentioned, whose army defeated Spartacus, he is seeking one of the consul positions. And Caesar considers aligning himself with Crassus to gain power. And we see this throughout Caesar's career, not necessarily that he's a coattail rider, but that he wants to be on the victorious side. But there's a problem for Crassus. Another man named Pompey Magnus is also seeking the consul position. And like we said, Crassus seems like kind of a dweeb. He's really wealthy, but he's unable to paint himself as a strong man in the eyes of the Senate and in the eyes of the Roman people. So he doesn't look great for the consul position because they want someone who gets things done. They want someone who can make Rome great again. Pretty much. So who is Pompey Magnus? He's a skilled military commander. And like pretty much everyone else in the Senate, it would seem. He is seeking glory and political power. So Pompey tries to ride on Crassus's success against Spartacus and steal credit for quelling the uprising. After Crassus had defeated Spartacus, Pompey's legions kill the remaining rebels, like the ones that had escaped crucifixion, and they take credit for the military victory. I assumed that the word pompous came from Pompey Magnus, given his behavior and his attitude, but I checked and it doesn't. But it still fits. So if you think of Pompey, think of like kind of a military asshole, I would say. Pompey and Crassus enter into this power struggle over the consul position, and they're both seeking executive functioning over Rome. Their stalemate halts the functioning of the government, but Caesar sees this as a political opportunity. And this is what brings us to the first triumvirate. So Caesar wants to avoid choosing the wrong side in the fight between Pompey and Crassus, and he definitely doesn't want to lose the honor that he has gained as a soldier. So he proposes that Pompey and Crassus work together and instead elect Julius Caesar himself as a surrogate consul, and he's going to push their legislation through the Senate. 
So at one point in time, before Caesar became a soldier, um, he had tried his hands in politics um, and he was elected as a People's Tribune, uh, which, like I said, um, People's Tribune was this assembly that was part of the Senate and it consisted of people who were either of plebeian descent or adopted by plebeian families. And so Caesar managed to get endorsement to basically become a People's Tribune. And then he became the consul now. So he became the compromise consul between Crassus and Pompey. And they sort of funded him um, and propped him up. And he was going to, you know, pass legislation for them. Uh, But he was also, at this point at least, Parenti argues that he himself was very much a populari. And what a populari is, is a member of the, the populari faction, which is this faction in the Senate that wanted some sort of popular reform and to curb the avarice of the elites, of the patricians, and to just introduce some very simple land reform, very simple grain doles uh, for people. Um, And they were positioned against what were called the optimates. And the optimates were this ultra-conservative faction of the Senate that traced the descent to really old money, old patrician families, and just... The notion of reform, the notion of giving peasants anything, of giving plebs anything, gives them a stroke. They think that any any sort of reform is the path towards full revolution and the destruction of property rights. I mean, where have we heard that before? But yeah. And then, of course, Aaron said uh, Caesar joined the army. Uh, he did end up getting a lot of honor and wealth. But also, and um, this is something I want to get into because Parenti argues this really well, I think, before Caesar... There were a a long line of reformers, of political reformers in Rome who tried through sort of political means passing some sort of legislation that can help the masses, you know, like whether it's land reform or uh, turning the grain dole from being a subsidy into a free dole to limiting the amount of land a person can hold. Uh, But all of these people met very grim ends due to the optimate. So you had, for example, the Gracchi brothers, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchi. Uh, Both of them had tried to pass legislation as People's Tribune and senators to help the masses of Rome. Um, One of them was um, assassinated. The other was murdered by a band in broad daylight. Uh, You had Claudius, the guy who tried to flirt with Caesar's wife. Um, He was assassinated. Catiline, who was also a timid reformer, he ended up being pushed out of Rome, exiled, and then stripped of all assets, and then uh, sentenced to death. Actually, he was sentenced to house arrest, but then he committed suicide, and I put this in quotations. Parenti Wait argued a second, that- did, did Catiline get epstein Is that what you're saying? Yes, he was the, he was the original Epstein. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, he was, he was, quote unquote, committed suicide and the cameras were all broken and the guards were like amateurs that we've never guarded before. Right. And, you know, everything, everything was a coincidence, I'm sure. History repeats itself. Yeah, like a circle, a flat circle. Okay. So Parenti argues that one of the reasons Caesar joined the army was not just for the honor of the wealth, but to build a cadre of uh, soldiers, of veterans who were A, experienced in war, and be loyal to him alone and can protect him from political opponents. At this point, Julius Caesar's daughter, Julia, also marries Pompey, securing a very powerful alliance. And in ancient Rome in particular, marriage was often a political endeavor, especially between wealthy people. Yeah, I mean, in a society with so much slaves... Your sexual desires and your political desires were completely separate in many cases. So marriage was a political process, whereas people's sexual preferences usually were, you know... uh, They abused their slaves. Yeah, yeah. They exploited and abused their slaves. Yeah, which is disgusting, of course. Um, But as consul, Julius Caesar rules an area of about a million square miles and commands an army of 150,000 men. The problem, however, is that the other members of the Senate understood that he was doing Pompey and Crassus's bidding. So Caesar uses street thugs to intimidate and beat up the senators who opposed him. So I don't want to defend Caesar basically using street militias to enforce his political will, but this wasn't entirely unheard of. In fact, it was a historically common phenomenon in Republican Rome. 
Various senators and political figures would act as patrons to clientele. The Roman word is clientele, where the modern word client comes from. And so the clientele were various urban plebeians and freedmen, and they would show up to the patron's house and ask for favors, whether it's money or to get some permit to open up a bar or whatever. And in return for those favors, the clientele would then act as a patron's muscle on the streets. So way before Caesar, multiple senators and consuls, like I just discussed before, were assassinated by their opponent's clientele, including uh, the Gracchi brothers and Clodius. Yeah, so the other senators perhaps rightfully saw Caesar as a dangerous man in pursuit of more power, which, I mean, he was, but... Due to Caesar's perhaps unsavory methods, Pompey and Crassus's legislation passes. Caesar, of course, becomes very wealthy. As we've mentioned, he throws these lavish parties in Rome. He also has an affair with a married aristocrat named Servilia, and Servilia is Brutus's mother. So Caesar did bang Brutus's mom. That's historical fact. Yeah, very alpha move. So Caesar is unpopular in the Senate, and Pompey and Crassus soon want him out of the triumvirate. Once their legislation gets passed, they're kind of like, all right, well, we have no use for you anymore, Caesar. You're kind of just in the way. So they propose giving him a governorship to push him out of Rome, basically telling Caesar to fuck off. And at first, Caesar, of course, doesn't take that well, but he starts to see another opportunity, and he decides to move outside Rome and focus on military success and conquering more territory. So he governs a territory that borders Gaul. Gaul is roughly modern-day France, and it's Rome's greatest threat, because the Gallic tribes like to sack Roman towns and cities, and nobody has thus far been able to conquer Gaul or put a stop to the sacking. Caesar knows that if he can conquer Gaul, he will be immensely popular back in Rome because the people are getting really tired of the Gallic tribes coming in and like taking all their stuff and attacking people and killing their kids and stuff like that. However, invading a foreign land without the permission of the Senate is considered treasonous and punishable by death. So Caesar wants to restore his glory as a military leader, but he has to move without the blessing of the Senate because they're not going to grant him more power by saying like, okay, yeah, sure, we're going to send you lots of armies and money, go ahead and invade Gaul, and then you're going to be super popular when they don't like Caesar. Caesar decides he's going to use his own legions to attack the Gallic tribes one by one before the tribes can unite. And he's pretty successful with this piecemeal strategy. Meanwhile, he rejects Roman supply lines and lives off the conquered territory. That is one of the first known examples of total war, which is quite impressive. But what's interesting is that Parenti's book actually acknowledges Caesar's role in expanding Rome's imperial domains and contributing to the sack and pillage of Gaul, including, by the way, enslaving tens of thousands of Gallic peoples. And I find this really interesting because Parenti and other sort of Marxist-Leninists and like leftist Puritans would dismiss someone like Bernie Sanders for being a sort of tool in the American imperial machine, you know, despite his domestic progressive bona fides. But, you know, it's interesting because Parenti puts Caesar on this pedestal as this, you know, radical reformer. And while he tackles his role in Rome's imperialism, he dismisses it as something all Roman politicians, reformists or not, had to participate in, in Rome's political environment, which I find hypocritical because... Bernie Sanders would also be a good progressive move. And, you know, he'd introduce a lot of reformist legislation to the U.S. polity that are direly needed. But yeah, I don't know. I feel like Parenti's humming and hawing over this is rather disappointing. I agree that it's difficult to cast modern day politics onto ancient Rome. And I don't like to sit here and be like, oh, well, slavery wasn't wrong then. Like, it's always wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But yeah, it's it's difficult. And it's also difficult to compare modern day politicians to Caesar because like who is suggesting that we invade Gaul? Let's say Canada is Gaul and Bernie Sanders leads legions of Americans into Ontario. I mean, I'd support it. I mean, the United States did attack Canada at one point as like a proxy for 
Britain, of course. And I'm pretty sure Canada built at least one fort, perhaps multiple forts, like on the border that just sat there. <laughs> well, yeah, and they also moved the capital to Ottawa to get the capital further away from the border. A lot of fire starting, that was common. Yes, including the White House. Part of the reason that we know so much about the Gallic Wars is because Caesar wrote his own accounts, which are now called the Gallic Commentaries in English. Um, And he sent these to Rome to try to gain support from the Roman people. And this actually works really well. So he basically writes down, like, we've been conquering all these Gallic tribes and slowly but surely Rome is rising and the Gauls aren't going to attack you anymore because the Roman army or my Roman legions have gotten in the way. So back in Rome, more soldiers want to join Caesar's army because, again, there's this pursuit of glory and fighting under a general like Caesar who is having so much success is a good idea. One of these men is called Mark Antony. He's a rising cavalry officer and a young noble in the Gallic War. And Caesar sees really great potential in Mark Antony, and they would remain close military and political allies for life. And during this time, Mark Antony was also elected as a People's Tribune, and he used his role as People's Tribune in the Senate to empower Caesar as being Caesar's representative in the Senate. So while Caesar was in Gaul campaigning, Mark Antony would use his veto powers to limit the Senate's anger and condemnation of Caesar. Meanwhile, there is this ruthless king and general of the Averni tribe in Gaul called Vercingetorix. And he's pretty much the biggest and really the only threat to Caesar conquering Gaul at this point. So Vercingetorix attempts to unite the Gallic tribes to fend off the Roman invasion as they've done before. So what Caesar has essentially been doing is one by one attacking the Gallic tribes before they can unite and fight off the Roman army together. So Vercingetorix naturally wants to get all the tribes together because a bigger army means they might actually be able to defeat the Romans. So Vercingetorix launches a scorched earth campaign to starve the Romans because remember, they've been living off the conquered land. Vercingetorix gathers the Averni army in this town called Elysia in what is now the Burgundy region of France. And their plan is to wait in the town until the reinforcements arrive from the other tribes, while the Roman army hopefully just starves outside because they've literally lit the land on fire. Caesar orders his troops to build a wall outside of Elysia to cut the town off from food and water. Then, hearing that 120,000 Gauls are on their way to fight, Caesar builds another wall around the first wall, with the Romans staying in between the walls. So this is actually a very ingenious move, and it's something that a lot of future sieges replicate. And you don't see it a lot in siege warfare in movies, uh, because movies like action, and they're not going to show you six months of just sitting around. But a lot of sieges would do this thing where the besieging army would surround a city and build a wall around it to, you know, cut it off, and then build another wall around the first wall and basically defend the army's rear from a relieving force. And I find that really interesting because this is one of the first documented cases of it happening and one of the many ways that Caesar showed how much of a military genius he was. Meanwhile, of course, back in Rome, Pompey and Crassus feel very threatened by Caesar's conquests and popularity but they're hoping that he's going to be killed in battle and then won't be their problem. So their Caesar fuck-off strategy is not going particularly well. Crassus decides he's going to try and conquer Parthia, which is modern-day Persia or the Iranian Empire, since he's still lacking in military esteem after Pompey stole his valor in defeating Spartacus. This campaign is a massive failure and Crassus is captured, and he's killed by the Parthians, by having molten gold poured down his throat to mock his greed. And the ancients, again, were extremely adept at choosing these ironic executions. I'm going to quote a quote uh, that was found in Parenti's book, he himself quoting a letter in Floris's history. Quote, He whose mind had burned with desire of gold might, when dead and inanimate, be burnt with gold itself. End quote. What a baller line. Yeah, if you've ever read 
Dante's Inferno, he dreams up these ironic punishments for everyone in hell. So there's these two characters who had an affair with each other. So their punishment in hell is constantly being whipped because they wanted the pleasures of the flesh in life. So now their flesh is constantly being deteriorated in hell. And I wonder if you could draw a direct line from this ancient punishment theory to figures like Dante. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, it it seems like a very common theme throughout history. But Dante Alighieri's Inferno is, of course, literature, whereas this is like a real guy who had metal poured in his mouth. Yeah, but to be fair, Dante's Inferno was also... Dante is like the ur crank in the sense that he basically put all of his personal enemies in hell in the Inferno. Like, it's filled with, like, people he didn't like, people who slighted him somehow, and they're getting, like, suffering because of it. Oh, it's hilarious, yeah. Yeah. And he just, like, basically writes into a line. He's like, all these people were being tortured. They're very horrible. They did horrible things. Also, Aaron is there. Yeah, basically, yeah. This poet who wrote something that I didn't like, or this fucking, like, coffee shop barista or whatever, who got my order wrong, is, like, amongst, like, all these, like, you know, rapists and pedophiles and whatever. Yeah, it's Dante's little black book. Yeah. So, now that Crassus is dead, Pompey runs unopposed for consul in Rome. And the triumvirate, which had pretty much already disintegrated because Caesar was booted from Rome, is now completely defunct. Pompey has seized power, and the power struggle now shifts to Pompey Magnus versus Julius Caesar. Turning our attention back to Gaul, the Gauls are extremely mad. They really hate Caesar because he has been conquering them rather successfully. The year is about 52 BC, and Caesar has a lot riding on this conquest because if he fails, first he'll he'll probably die, so, you know, that's the end of that. But if he succeeds... He will definitely be a hero back in Rome, and this could be absolutely transformative for his career as a politician. The Romans have built these walls. They have one around the town of Elysia and one outside that wall to try to fend off the Gallic tribes coming from the rest of what is now France. They are attacked from both sides of the walls that they built. The Gallic tribes manage to find a weak spot in the outer wall, but the Roman army converges on that point while Caesar sends cavalry detachments to surround the Gauls. And they probably weren't actually surrounded, but it looked like they were, so they retreat. And this is now considered one of the greatest military achievements in Roman history. Vercingetorix, of course, surrenders. And Caesar has Vercingetorix in chains, and he ends up uh, keeping Vercingetorix locked up for like six years, And then later on, when Caesar is the dictator in Rome, he has Vercingetorix brought out and publicly executed in a sort of festival. What's so interesting, too, is that in Netflix's Roman Empire series, for instance, Vercingetorix is really painted like a villain because he is the biggest threat to Julius Caesar's conquest of Gaul. But to the people of Gaul at that time, He was their hero and their last hope. He was the last stand against Roman imperialism. Yeah, I mean, it's a common trope that history is written by the victors. But I find it hilarious how in a lot of these shows, and I've seen it in like HBO's Rome as well as Gladiator and so on, that Vercingetorix is portrayed as this like gigantic brute with like a war hammer and like a helmet with horns on it. And like, you know, your prototypical quote unquote barbarian. Um, Right. But I'm sure for for Gaul, you know, they, they just didn't want to submit to Rome. He was just another, you know, military commander that was resisting enroachment. So it's ironic that we think of him as a barbarian and not Caesar as a barbarian. Yeah, and we also still think very much that Rome was essentially civilizing the places that it conquered. Like, that's still the narrative that exists today. Yeah, all the portrayals you have of Gaul are like these like ramshackle villages um, as opposed to like, you know, the splendor of Rome. And yeah, it's very, it's very uh, deterministic. It's very colonial attitude. I don't know. I, I, I found this uh, researching for this episode really interesting in interrogating these assumptions. Right. And the, 
the narrative very, very simplified, of course, is like the Romans conquered France. They built the Pont de Garde, which is still there. Therefore, lucky France. Pretty much. After Caesar conquers Gaul, he is, of course, extremely popular among the Roman public. He has vanquished Vercingetorix and the Gauls who, you know, kept sacking them. He is growing in wealth, fame, popularity with the army as soldiers want to fight under someone who wins battles. And Pompey realizes he done fucked up. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Yeah, his plan to get rid of Caesar by sending him to the outskirts of the empire and hoping he would just, like, fuck off and die, for lack of a better term, went exactly the opposite, as he had hoped. Yeah, and I mean, I understand soldiers wanting to fight under someone who wins battles, like Caesar, and unlike, for example, John McCain, who spent his entire career crashing planes. Yeah, Pompey kind of turns his gaze from war back into Roman politics. And he thinks he should punish Caesar for waging an illegal war. Because like we said, you weren't supposed to try and conquer places without the approval of the Senate. So the Senate unanimously decides to bring charges against Julius Caesar. Brutus, whose mom, Servilia, was Caesar's bang buddy, is now in the Senate. And he feels personally loyal to Caesar as a family friend, but he wants to choose the winning side. And this is a common thread throughout Brutus's political career as it is throughout Caesar's career. People seek power, of course, by aligning themselves with the victors, because if you align with the losers and they lose, then you're also a loser. Caesar also learns around this time that his daughter Julia and her son have died during childbirth, and this greatly saddens him. Caesar and his troops march to the Rubicon River in Italy, and he deliberates invading Rome. This is where the phrase crossing the Rubicon comes from, because once Julius Caesar and his legions march over that river, this is an action with very heavy consequences that cannot be taken back. He's committing treason. If he does that, his life is forfeit. Right. And I want, I want to state here, and I, I'm not sure how accurate this is because I've only found it argued in Parenti's book, but this happens after months of negotiations where Caesar repeatedly proposes that both he and Pompey disarm simultaneously to find a negotiated peace. However, Pompey, backed by the Optimates in the Senate, declines this offer and continues to amass his own legions. So Parenti's argument is that Caesar had no choice but to march on Rome. What is it with dictators and marching on Rome? The idea being that either Caesar was going to be brandished a traitor anyways, or he had to militarily fight for his own survival. And whether Caesar was actually going to disarm if Pompey accepted his offer is a whole other conversation. But I find it interesting because if this is true, and it's a big if, then it shows that Caesar was trying his best to find a negotiated treaty or a truce before, you know, starting a civil war. Yeah, I don't love historical arguments of what would have happened, because it's just quite a difficult thing to say. You know, what would have happened if Vercingetorix had won instead of Julius Caesar? Like, the history of the Roman Empire probably would have changed, but it's pretty impossible to say really how that would have went. And I suppose one of my issues with Parenti's scholarship as a whole is that he quite confidently states what would have happened if history had been a little bit different. And I just, I don't think it's that simple. Oh, I agree. I definitely agree. I think, I think Parenti needs to read up on the butterfly effect more. At this point in 49 BC, Caesar has been away from Rome for eight years and he and his legions make that decision and they cross the Rubicon River beginning a civil war. Pompey suggests that the Senate leaves Rome and forms in Greece because he needs to assemble a new army to fight Caesar. Rome begins to devolve into unrest as the government isn't managing things like grain shipments, so as the Senate is away, the mice will play. Pompey expects Caesar to conquer Rome while it's unguarded and just be like, okay, I I captured it, I'm the king. And then the plan, I suppose, is that Pompey would build up his army, go back to Rome, oust Caesar, and things would be as they were before. But instead, Caesar decides to go after Pompey right away. So they race to the coast of southern Italy. Caesar arrives a little bit too late, and Pompey and the rest of the Senate have already left for Greece. 
instead of just giving up and being like, whelp, as I think most people would do at that point, Caesar begins his armies to start building ships and says, we are going to follow them to Greece. Pompey, of course, arrives and he starts raising his army. And he's particularly popular in Eastern Europe and the Middle East because that's where he was a conqueror. That's where his military successes were. So Caesar sets sail in pursuit of Pompey with half his troops while Mark Antony prepares the rest. Pompey does build up a larger army than Caesar, but he's a little bit rusty as a general. So keep in mind, Caesar's troops are battle-hardened from the conquest of Gaul. They're loyal to Caesar as a general. They are experienced fighters and have immediately come out of these battles, whereas Pompey has been sitting in the Senate, drinking wine, fanning himself with palm leaves, doing whatever it is they do. Pompey depends very greatly on his cavalry, but Caesar anticipates this, and he holds troops in reserve to break the cavalry, and he's successful once again. It's really hard for us to overstate Julius Caesar's brilliance as a military strategist. Yeah, he's definitely one of a kind in terms of history. He's like Napoleon and Genghis Khan in that respect, and one of those people who greatly advanced military tactics well beyond their era. Yeah, and he is particularly adept at foreseeing what his opponent is likely to do and then fending off that attack, except for, you know, the last The one time. Yeah. <laughs> the one time. <laughs> Caesar claims victory at Pharsalus in Greece, and he captures the Roman senators. But Pompey has already fled. So Caesar's main goal is now to capture Pompey. He sends Mark Antony back to Rome to maintain order so he can focus on apprehending his nemesis. And it's interesting that senators like Marcus Brutus and Gaius Cassius were among those who fled with Pompey, but Caesar forgives them and offers them honors and pardons. And his policy was always one of reconciliation and turning enemies into friends. Not necessarily out of the goodness of his heart, but out of a purely pragmatic calculation that it's easier to turn enemies into allies than to build these chains of resentment and bitterness that might stab him in the back. In this case, his errors in judgment were to be fatal and he was going to get stabbed in the back. So, you know, quite literally. you win some, you lose some. Right. Caesar highly suspects that Pompey would go to Alexandria in Egypt because Egypt had significant debt and Pompey had loaned them money like out of his personal coffers. And Egypt's king Ptolemy was only 14 years old, but he had regents to guide him. At the same time, Egypt was in its own power struggle between Ptolemy and his sister Cleopatra. So when Pompey arrives in Alexandria, he pleads with Ptolemy for help. But Ptolemy kills him in the hopes that it will turn Caesar into an ally in his war against Cleopatra. So when Caesar arrives in Alexandria, Ptolemy presents Pompey's head, hoping that Caesar will be swayed by Ptolemy killing his enemy. But this actually has the opposite effect. Caesar is really aghast at Pompey's undignified death, and he's annoyed that his pursuit of his enemy would end in such anticlimactic way. Apparently, and HBO's Rome actually dramatizes this event, Caesar wept upon seeing Pompey's head and had the actual assassins executed. He also organized a full funeral for Pompey, seeing him as a former ally and mentor, so to speak. Yeah, and it's also likely that he wanted to capture Pompey, take him back to Rome, and have him face accountability for fleeing with the Senate. And he could have much better made an example out of Pompey by either executing or forgiving him if he could have captured him alive. Yeah, I mean, it would provide a lot more uh, legal justification for Caesar seizing power if he had like a mock trial of Pompey instead of, you know, being presented with his head. I think he was also genuinely annoyed that after Pompey had basically exiled Caesar from Rome, then Pompey fled with most of the Senate from Rome and Caesar had to literally like build ships and chase after him. I think he really just wanted to get his hands on him. And instead, Pompey was killed by a 14-year-old. Yeah, I mean, his thunder was well and thoroughly stolen. Right. Ptolemy realizes that Caesar isn't keen to help him, and he takes a different approach. He just imprisons Caesar until he agrees to lend his armies to Egypt. So back in Rome, 
The Republic is without a strong government, and food is dwindling. The plebeians are losing patience. Mark Antony is a good soldier, but he's a pretty shitty politician, and he asked the army to quell unrest rather than intervening in structural policy. Women and children are killed, making the government even more unpopular. In Egypt, Cleopatra finds Caesar and appeals for his help in her fight against Ptolemy. So essentially both Ptolemy and his sister Cleopatra, who are vying for power, want Caesar on their side and know whomever he chooses is going to likely vanquish the other. Caesar sees Cleopatra as a future stable leader and a friend for Rome. And Cleopatra, of course, needs Caesar's armies if she's going to militarily seize power. It's also that Ptolemaic Egypt was Rome's breadbasket. So by stabilizing Egypt and securing an alliance with Cleopatra, Caesar can secure grain shipments for Rome. Um, Rome at this time had a population of like, I think it was like over a million people. So there were a lot of mouths to feed. And more than just a military genius, Caesar's political acumen was superb. And by, by allying himself with Cleopatra he can guarantee shipments of grain to Rome um, for the foreseeable future, at least. Yeah, he's basically banking on the fact that if he helps Cleopatra seize power, she will almost be like a proxy ruler for him back in Rome. And at this point, Egypt is really a client state of Rome. Yeah, pretty much. In 47 BC, Cleopatra and Caesar's armies force out Ptolemy, who drowns in the Nile, allegedly. It seems like a weird way for him to go, but we'll buy it. And they expel Ptolemy's political allies. Cleopatra, at this point, takes full control of Egypt. Our next episode is actually going to focus on Cleopatra, so we will expand on this next week. But famously, Julius Caesar and Cleopatra briefly become lovers. And at this point, I believe Cleopatra is 23 and Caesar is like 50 or something, 53 or something. So it's interesting. One of the most enduring questions in history is why? Like, why did Cleopatra want to get with Caesar? Did she see this as a political move on her part? Did she actually love and adore and respect him? And the same goes the other way around. I don't think we're ever exactly going to know why. We can make uh, theories, of course. So there, there's a political side to it. But I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if Caesar had genuine affections for Cleopatra. I mean, Caesar had many mistresses, but... I wouldn't be surprised if he held some sentiments for some of them, like Servilia or Cleopatra. Oh, definitely, yeah. Caesar suspects, however, that Cleopatra also has a political interest in keeping him out of Rome because Egypt is threatened by Rome's growing influence over the Mediterranean. So Caesar bids her farewell. He's like, Cleopatra, I'm sorry. It's been fun. I have to go back to Rome. I can't hang out with you and like watch my empire disintegrate. What a great way to break up with someone. It's not you. It's me. I I have an empire. The empire is over there. I have to go. It's not you. I swear. Mark Antony is back (laughs) there fucking things up. (laughs) After 12 years at this point of de facto exile and a civil war, Gaius Julius Caesar returns to Rome. He is very angry at Mark Antony's shitty job leading, and he realizes he's going to have to undo the damage to his reputation brought on by Antony's ineptitude because everyone understands that Mark Antony is Caesar's like little proxy in Rome who is supposed to be governing. Caesar, like Amr said, decides to grant clemency to the senators who sided with Pompey and fled Rome. And in response, the Senate then confirms Caesar as dictator for 10 years. And it's important to note here that dictator doesn't imply absolute rulership like it does now, but that's basically what it would become. Like our word for dictator comes from the sort of emperorship that Caesar would eventually move toward. Yeah, because prior to Caesar, a dictator was often appointed by the Senate in times of extreme emergency in terms of either six months or one year, and that was it. Uh, So 10 years is definitely new. But in Caesar's defense, and I can't believe I just said in Caesar's defense, Rome's unspoken constitution was never really, you know, written in stone, metaphorically speaking. And it was always broken if it served the purposes of the senators uh, in charge. For example, the elites, um, the sort of optimates 
abrogated the constitution multiple times to declare a senatus consultum ultimum, which is a period where all constitutional protections are suspended in the interest of national security. Basically, Rome's version of the Patriot Act or a military emergency. Before Caesar became consul initially, they also appointed Pompey as a sole consul multiple times to deal with various local disturbances. And this was in clear violation of constitutional norms that demanded, you know, two consuls per term. Yeah, it's no exaggeration to say that the constitution was not written in stone because it wasn't written at all. It was basically a series of precedents. So Caesar also wants Brutus in his corner, perhaps out of loyalty to his former lover, Servilia, or maybe out of respect for Brutus's patrician bloodline, because Brutus is descended from some of the Republic's founders, some of their original patrician senators. So he starts to designate more duties to Brutus. Caesar could thus make sweeping reforms with the power granted to him as dictator. He made it his goal to restore order and institute these reforms. Among these were bread and circuses, I'm sure you've heard the phrase before, so he distributed grain and he held gladiator contests to entertain people, and I don't think it could be overstated if you were a Roman plebeian and you went to the Colosseum and there were like actual elephants and lions and shit, how incredible that would be, how awe-inspiring and how it would speak to the power of the society that you lived in. Not to mention they usually flooded the Colosseum and enacted naval battles in there as well, which is must have been magnificent to see. Yeah, like I think you would actually at that point start to see someone like Julius Caesar as somewhat of a god. Oh yeah, absolutely. And to go back to the grain distribution, what's interesting is that before Caesar, grain distribution was a sort of, there was like a dole, but it was subsidized. Like you had to, like the plebs had to pay some amount to the state for grain. But under Caesar, he made grain free for the masses. So whether that's a populist move or a genuine concern and sympathy is beyond consideration. The material effects were very real. Caesar also begins a massive infrastructure program to provide jobs. Um, He focused on expanding projects which would benefit ordinary people, for instance, aqueducts, bringing water to Rome, things like that. So he would employ the peasants, the plebeians, and then they would also benefit from that work. It was basically FDR's New Deal, but like 2,000 years ago. He also amended the calendar to the solar year, which is what we still use today. About that, before before Caesar, Roman calendar was extremely convoluted, uh, for me, incomprehensible. Caesar turned it to what we use today, or what we used for six, 1,600 years, I believe, until Pope Gregory changed like, little amendments, um, because Caesar did not account for leap years, which led to time basically going backwards a bit um, and being a bit off, and Pope Gregory added the leap years. Yeah, going back to the Roman calendar before this being very convoluted, by the time Caesar became dictator, the Roman Senate straight up did not know what day it is. Like they had lost track of their own calendar. So Caesar was like, this needs to be fixed. Yeah. And the month of July, which we're now in, was named after Julius Caesar. And the month of August was named after his nephew, Augustus. Yeah. So that's why... At least in the English language, there's a split of January, February, March, etc. being like one, two, three. And then September should be the seventh month and October should be the eighth month and so on. But for whatever reason, they decided to put Julius and Augustus smack in the middle of the calendar. Yeah, they could have just put them in the end. But no, I guess they wanted to be in the summer or something. I think perhaps that's what it is. I wonder if Julius Caesar, or I think Augustus was the one who actually put them in, but was like, I want the pool party months. Thank you very much. (laughs) Yeah. Caesar also granted full citizenship to the conquered peoples of Gaul, expanding Rome as an empire. This is really interesting because people would argue against it and for it, but Caesar also added 200 senators from Gaul and Hispania into the Senate, basically stacking the Senate with his supporters. And it's politically cunning because, you know, you're stacking the Senate with people who are loyal to you, but it's also reformist in a way because Caesar was the first of people to treat Gaul and Hispania, the people there as citizens of Rome, as Roman subjects, not a conquered people. He sought to assimilate them into the Roman polity. 
And I think that's interesting because I guess we can see some of that today in terms of the two-state versus one-state solution in occupied Palestine and whether including people into a conquered entity um, and giving them full citizenship is a quicker way to fight for civil rights and for full equality or if separation is more appropriate. It's also interesting how in conquered places, Rome didn't really enforce its own culture in the same way that we perceive empires today as trying to homogenize everyone under the empire. So what they would do, for instance, is like in Bath in what is now England, when the Romans conquered, Bath is, or it was essentially a temple to the water deities. So Rome had its water god or goddess who was Neptune, and the Celtic people of Britain at the time had their water goddess, who I believe was Minerva. So instead of the Romans saying like, no, you're not allowed to worship Minerva, you have to worship Neptune, they just built a temple to both of them and said like, okay, this is the water deity temple, enjoy. Yeah, I mean, as far as Rome was concerned, it didn't define itself by ethnicity, And I think the interesting thing is the converse of that, which is the Roman slave trade. It wasn't ethnically based or racialized. Basically, anyone in Rome can be a slave, whether you're conquered or whether you have a lot of debt. And so you have to sell yourself into slavery. It was a very, I guess it was a society that really didn't define itself by a particular ethnicity. You were either a citizen or you were not. Right. And the divisions within citizenry were based on class and land. Yes. Yeah. Julius Caesar also ordered a more comprehensive census. And during this time, his dictatorship expands indefinitely. The biggest reform for Caesar during this time, and I think the one that really earned him the ire of the patricians, was land reform, which is, you know, even up to this day, if any, if any political leader in like a third world country were to introduce land reform, he's going to find a bullet faster than this, you can say, CIA. And for Caesar, the land reform he enacted was limiting how much land an individual can hold, and so breaking the monopoly on land by these very large landholders, um, larger than they had large land, not large as in they were large, though I assume some of them were large. Definitely. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, it was a sign of your status to be at home all day eating and not walking. So they were probably yeah. large. Um, he also made it mandatory for landholders, if you were had other people working your land, to have no less than one third of their workforce consist of freed men, uh, which was basically a jobs program because before that, um, landholders would just have slaves do everything. So by initiating that quota, you can have all these unemployed people in Rome get jobs as farmers. He also publicly purchased large tracts of fertile land in modern-day Capua to redistribute to over 20,000 families, uh, Roman families, including veteran soldiers of the Gallic campaign. Um, And he did this by raising funds through his earlier conquests, along with continuing conquests and his personal coffers. As you could imagine, Caesar becomes extremely popular with the public as most of the people in Rome are benefiting from these reforms rather than losing from them. The people who are losing in most circumstances are the wealthy class. So the Senate really fears his rising power. At this point, Caesar also begins having some health issues. Um, It sounds like he was dealing with epilepsy, possibly brought on by stress. Can you say Caesar's seizures? Five times fast. I can't even say it once. Caesar's seizures, Caesar's seizures, Caesar's seizures, Caesar's seizures, Caesar's seizures. Done. That's incredible. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh my God. Damn. I'm impressed. You should thank be you, part you. of Caesar's circus, his Coliseum. You should just get on the stage and do that. <laughs> I'm impressed myself. I don't think I was going to do it. I was gonna, I'll give it a go, but there you go. Damn. Anyway. Cleopatra comes to Rome and she brings with her a surprise. She has Caesar's baby, Caesarion, which literally means little Caesar, pizza, pizza. This shocked Rome because Cleopatra herself was a queen from a foreign land and likely saw Caesarion as the embodiment of a future alliance between Egypt and Rome. 
It also shocked Rome because tomatoes were not part of Rome until after colonization. So when they saw the pizza, they're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> Caesar also now has a male heir, and he may have considered consolidating power more in the form of a monarchy. And Rome, up until about 500 BC, used to be a monarchy, but that monarchy was quite repressive and brutal to its people, and it was overthrown in favor of a republic at around 500 BC. And that sort of memory lingers on, so Romans in general, even the plebeians, have very hostile views towards anyone who presumes himself to be a monarch or a king. At this point, Caesar decides he's going to invade Parthia, a victory that would make him even more popular with the Roman public. And remember that Parthia is where Crassus had been unsuccessful and had gold poured down its throat. So risky endeavor here. But for the Senate, this was really the last straw because Caesar's power was growing so immense that they knew if he did manage to conquer Parthia, that's it. Perhaps he would link up again with Cleopatra and just rule his empire and it would be the end of the Republic. So they start plotting to get rid of him. The date comes March 15th, 44 BC. Beware, beware the Ides of March. The Senate called an emergency meeting three days before Caesar planned to leave for Parthia, because once Caesar was out of Rome and surrounded by his military bodyguards, it would be impossible for the Senate to get to him. There is a lot said about that particular day, both in myth and in history. It is said, for example, that when Caesar woke up, his wife informed him of a dream she had that night where Caesar lay in her lap covered in blood. He almost cancelled the Senate meeting because of this and sent Mark Anthony to inform the senators. However, Decimus Brutus, who was unrelated to Marcus, um, who was a co-conspirator of the assassination, but had earlier served with Caesar in Gaul and so Caesar trusted him, had arrived to, you know, escort Caesar to the Senate. And when he heard about Caesar not wanting to go, he managed to reverse Caesar's decision by playing on his masculinity and his wife being hysterical as women at that time were wont to do. Um, Basically, he was just going like, you know, like, don't listen to this broad over there. She's being crazy. You're a man. You, You know, people will say, you know, you're being influenced by your wife. Do you really want that? On the way to the Senate... Uh, There were conflicting reports, um, and again, this is historically um, judgy, or vague rather, but uh, there were conflicting reports that someone had tried to warn Caesar about the conspiracy. And the conflicting reports say that either someone got to his house after he left, or they handed him a note during the walk to the Senate, and I say walk, but he was carried on a litter by slaves, or that he failed to read the note given to him at the time. In any case, the warning didn't come through and he ended up going to the Senate. You likely know the story. Caesar gets to the Senate and the senators stab Caesar 23 times on the Senate floor. Caesar didn't actually say a tu brute as Shakespeare wrote, but he may have said kaisu technon and you child when he realized Brutus was in on the conspiracy. Caesar likely knew that some of the senators wanted him dead, but he probably didn't think they actually had the guts to kill him. I mean, the assassination itself began when a senator by the name of Simber approached Caesar inquiring about a pardon for his brother. Caesar declined, and then Simber pulled Caesar's toga off his shoulder, which was a signal for the conspirators to attack. A senator by the name of Casca attacks first and misses because he's a dweeb, And Caesar ends up stabbing him with a stylus, which is like a a pen of sorts. The other senators then sort of converge and stab Caesar to death. One co-conspirator's role in this, the names are contradictory, but there was someone whose job it was to distract Mark Antony, who was co-consul with Caesar, in conversation outside the Senate to avoid him defending Caesar, because Mark Antony at the time was a very intimidating and strong man. After the assassination, Brutus tries to calm the Senate down, especially the people who weren't involved, by declaring this to be a tyrannicide. But the senators panic and leave in a sort of stampede. Brutus then departs the Senate with the co-conspirators, brandishing the bloody knives above their heads and declaring that the tyrant is dead. They were trying to portray themselves, and indeed they might have seen themselves as liberators who killed the tyrant, 
but they gravely misjudged the public's love for Caesar. Rome mourns Caesar and a political vacuum opens. The new power struggle is between Brutus and Mark Antony, who still stayed loyal to Caesar until his death. Brutus is defeated on the battlefield and throws himself on a friend's sword to avoid capture. This is a pretty common thing in Roman battles and civil wars. And Mark Antony, as we know, ends up fleeing to Egypt. We're going to discuss this next week, so tune in. But what we want to talk about now is the fate of the Republic. Was the Roman Republic saved by Julius Caesar's assassination? And the short answer to this, I think Amr agrees, is no. And the long answer is no. (laughs) So Caesar's nephew, Octavian, who would later become known as Augustus Caesar, would become the emperor of Rome. This is kind of another point toward our lingering thesis on this podcast that assassinating a single leader is not going to reverse the entirety of that person's political momentum. There's that. And there's also that while Caesar as dictator enacted a lot of reforms to help the plebeians, Octavian, um, or Augustus, basically completely turned all of those reforms back. He cancelled them, he erased them, whatever you want to say. And Parenti does a good job of exploring this, where Augustus Caesar ends up becoming a sort of... He, He consolidates political power, but his power is used to economically enfranchise the patricians again by basically redacting all of Caesar's reforms. So in that way, it sort of turns into the worst of both worlds because the Republic is dead and power has once again been seized from the proletariat. Pretty much, yeah. It's 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 the worst possible outcome. And it also betrays the hypocrisy of the senators who were willing to kill Caesar on some allegations that he was becoming too tyrannical, but none of them lifted a finger to kill Augustus even when he declared himself emperor uh, because he was protecting their class interests and they knew it. They were willing to sacrifice political power if they maintained class interest. Right. So it really raises questions about dictatorship in its entirety. Yeah. I mean, for me, the, que- the, big, the big question, and it's one that I don't have an answer to, Is a progressive dictator, if we could use the word, better than an oligarchy controlling some sort of superficial senate or representative body? Like if you're if you're a Roman like plebeian, right, and you're starving, you can't you can barely afford bread, you owe like a hundred thousand sesterces to some moneylender, you've already sold two children to slavery, and you're just you know your your life is a life of misery. And Caesar comes along and he's like, okay, I'm going to give you some land in Capua. You can farm, cancel all debt, which is something he did. He canceled like a bunch of debt. You know, you, you get so-and-so rights. Your your constitutional rights are not abrogated. Your people's tribune for your representation. But I'm a dictator. As a Roman plebeian, I'll say, sure, yeah, this sounds great. Fantastic. Sign me up. Go Caesar. Yeah, and I think... We so often distill Roman history into the history of Roman conquering that was based out of Rome and Italy, but don't really pay attention to what life was like for the average person living in Rome or living in the conquered territories or in Egypt or anywhere else at the time, and how in some ways history moves so quickly, but it also moves so slowly, where if you were just a peasant living in Gaul and you weren't a soldier, but Vercingetorix was defeated and then Rome took Gaul and then you were made a Roman citizen, really would your life change that much? Like we're looking at it as this drastic change in politics because it was for Caesar and the Senate. But for those people, they were probably just like, okay. Yeah, I mean, you're still paying taxes, just your your grain is going to someone else. But also the more interesting thing is and, and Parenti does a good job of talking about this as well. History up until very, very, very recently was monopolized by a very, very exclusive class of elites because up until recently, literacy was very monopolized. So people who wrote history were part of a very exclusive elite class of people, whether it's, you know, patricians or the church or the nobility or even up until, you know, very 
up until today, really, think tanks and corporations and so on and so forth. So if you're a classicist studying Rome and you want to explore Roman society, there's really not that many sources describing the, the life of an average Roman peasant or, you know, uh, urban proletariat. But there is like volumes and volumes and volumes of books describing the rabble, the mob of Roman, you know, these filthy, unwashed plebs, you know, coming to take our land, coming to take our property, usually written by guys who owned like 200 slaves. Yeah, that's a really good point. The other interesting thing, slavery, I mean, for all of his reforms, Caesar never sought to abolish slavery because like we said, Rome was built on slavery as an economic uh, system. And so despite, however, however his progressive bona fides were, Caesar knew not to tackle that issue. And it's interesting that up until recently, slavery was taken as a given. Like even for progressives, you were going to give rights to some people. Or even, for example, the prophet Muhammad, when he emerged in Arabia, he enacted uh, laws and uh, rules to treat your slaves better. But he never really went around saying, okay, we're not going to enslave anyone anymore. Slavery is bad. Everyone's free. Yeah. And it's also very clear that Julius Caesar understood the economic impact slavery had on Rome, of course, because he understood that human enslavement undercut the labor market for free men and tried to meddle with that by mandating, as you said earlier, that a third of the work on agricultural farms had to be done by free men. Yeah, because he understood, and this is a, this shows how much he how strategic he was, because the glut of slaves coming in depopulated the, the the countryside. Like all the all the rural plebs were forced out of their land and to move into cities, where a lot of them were you know doing very precarious labor or were unemployed. And he understood that you know the labor force needed some work to stabilize the economy, and so yeah, he introduced these quotas. So he was very, very cunning and keen in that way. Yeah, and the way that Rome was able to keep enslaved people coming in was by conquering new territory. Exactly. And, you know, for all of his reform, Caesar was also an imperialist in that way. And he had to rely on conquest for slavery, for money, and to politically maintain Rome's hegemony over the Mediterranean. I think the imperial history of Rome, as we've said, is quite fascinating because it's read overall, I would say, as a positive thing. That people today still look at Rome's expanding empire and think this is a good thing because it brought aqueducts and roads and agriculture and so on and so forth. And again, we can't comment on what would or would not have happened if Caesar had lost certain battles or if Rome had never become a republic or XYZ. But I think today we are actually still in awe of what Julius Caesar was able to accomplish. Yeah, I mean, he's one of those people that's like once in a thousand years, once in a hundred years, a true sort of history distilled into one person. Him, Napoleon, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, Genghis Khan, these people who, instead of history working on them, they work on history. Right. And I think, like we said at the beginning of the episode, Julius Caesar and his ambition in particular are still sort of held ambiguously, where if you told me that a certain politician was behaving like or wanted to behave like Julius Caesar, I wouldn't know without a little more interrogation whether you meant that as a positive or a negative thing. Yeah, exactly. It's a very muddled and nuanced uh, issue. And I think It's part of why I find it interesting and I love reading about it, and him for that matter. Right, because the question of was Julius Caesar good or did his assassination, of course it fundamentally changed Rome, but was that for the better or for the worse? 2,000 years later and we still wonder. I think that's just a fascinating element of history. Yeah, and I mean, to our listeners, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the matter, so please do reach out to us and let us know your opinions. Caesar, good or bad or in between? Uh, I prefer Bloody Marys myself, but I could do with (laughs) a good Caesar right now. 
Yeah, definitely a fascinating character. We will come back next week and discuss Caesar's lover and comrade Cleopatra, which we're super excited for. So please tune in next Monday for your free episode on Cleopatra. If you like the show, please subscribe, of course, to get those free episodes. You can also find us on Patreon, where we offer content including book reviews, episodes about current events, free bonus episodes. We give shout outs on the show. It's also a direct line to us to suggest episode content like our friend Meher did, wanting us to do Julius Caesar. So thank you, Meher. Yeah, thanks, Meher. You guys can find us on Instagram at Das Criminal Pod. We like to post photos, maps, things like that, that correspond with our episodes. So there's plenty of resources for you there as well. Yeah. So we will see our Patreon subscribers on Wednesday with a bonus episode. And to the rest of you, see you on Monday with Cleopatra. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.